sure you tuned into last week's commencement ceremony, the, the first ever virtual commencement in the history of Santa Barbara City College. Uh, today, we have uh, a, an issue that has been a major one, and it, this was true even before the pandemic, um, the question of young people's mental health, mental health in general in the United States, but certainly young people's mental health and student mental health uh, has certainly been on a lot of folks' minds. There's been a lot of work and resources put into this, this area. Uh, and we're very proud at Santa Barbara City College to have some innovative things happening uh, on our campus. So we decided that um, near the early parts of this series, we would, we would take this issue and, and really bring it to the forefront. So it's, it's with great pleasure today that we have the two presenters that we have uh, joining us today. They know more about this uh, combined than probably anyone at our institution. Uh, we have with us uh, Becky Bean. Becky is actually the director of The Well. She's a student program officer. Uh, so I'm sorry, student program advisor, technically. Uh, and uh, she's, she's really been the face and the energy behind The Well. And The Well, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, um, is actually the first freestanding um, wellness uh, organization within a college like ours, in a, in a community college uh, in the entire state of California. You may know that we have 114 campuses and with the online college 115 um, and this is something that is is truly uh, at the vanguard uh, of this movement so we're very happy to have Becky with us and she's going to share a bit about what the well is doing and all the programming and partnerships behind it uh, we also have with us Allison Boswick and Allison is truly a veteran of the institution she has been with Santa Barbara City College for 31 years uh, and she's done that in multiple ways she's been an academic uh, she's been an instructor she's been a career counselor uh, and a mental health counselor. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist uh, and is with uh, SBCC's Student Health and Wellness Services. Uh, so she has a, a deep knowledge and deep history with the institution and, and the issues around mental wellness and mental health and uh, will be sharing with us a bit like that, uh, about that. Um, we will have time after the uh, presentation for some questions and answers. And I will again remind you as Rachel did uh, to please go ahead and use the chat function and we will curate those. I'll pose those to our panelists and uh, we'll have a, a robust discussion. So with that as preamble, uh, I'm very happy to uh, toss it first to you, Allison Boston. Okay, are the slides coming up? They are indeed. Okay, next slide please. I'm sorry, I'm just waiting for you. The slides, thank you. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start off by just telling you about our mission. And our mission, as you can all read, is to ensure that a diverse SBCC student community feels heard, respected, and encouraged to gain the vital knowledge, tools, and support to move toward optimal lifelong health and wellness. So just wanted to give you an overview of what our mission is for a link it. What we offer, the services that we offer for counseling within student health service and wellness for all students who have paid the student health fee and are enrolled are individual and confidential sessions. We see students individually as couples, we can even see families, as long as one person is a student they can bring in any other person within their family or a significant other. We also provide a lot of mental health resources. We have extensive re referrals and very good relationships with offsite referral sources such as hospice and Santa Barbara Behavioral Wellness, Cottage Hospital, Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics, um, the Holman Group. We have an extensive research, I'm sorry, refer referral resource. This is really awkward speaking on a camera, so excuse me if I blunder a little bit. It's um, just being honest and being human because it's awkward. So we have extensive services available for you and we are very well utilized. We, um, I will be talking about how the utilization has changed pre and post COVID. However, we've been very, very well utilized. And I think students find us as a safe resource, not only student health services and wellness, but the well that Becky will also talk about further. Next slide, slide please. Great, and uh, we launched The Well in January 2019, and over the last year and four months, we've worked hard to provide a range of dynamic support groups, workshops, and events all around holistic mind and body health. And um, I'm so grateful for our student health and wellness services staff, our personal counseling team, and for all their passion and dedication facilitating many of our support groups and workshops. We couldn't have done it without them. So thank you everyone out there. 
Also, we've had an outpouring of support from local um, nonprofit uh, agencies, as well as uh, community health educators who have come to the well to teach our students, and they've really helped the program to grow and flourish. Um, it's also been an honor to collaborate and partner with a variety of different departments on campus. And um, again, thank you all for believing in the well, um, wanting to collaborate. Um, I specifically want to thank DSPS, CESJ, the Food Pantry, Emoja, EOPS, the Career Center, the Transfer Academy, and ISSP. So thank you all. It's been a labor of love and a collaborative team effort for sure, not only launching the program, but continuing to make it run beautifully. And um, just like Jeff was saying, what's so unique about The Well is that we are the first freestanding wellness center out of all 115 California community colleges. And what's interesting is we're adding holistic health and wellness support groups, workshops, and events to the traditional student health and wellness program. So we are really doing something that's revolutionary, that's innovative, and we're really excited to see what's to come in the future. And ideally, we're hoping to be a model um, for sustainable change, not only on our campus, but for these wonderful other California community colleges, and hopefully down the road, they can replicate the model that we have been bringing to life. Next slide, please. Great, so I'm gonna be talking now, what is wellness? What does that mean for SBC students? So the well has been dedicated primarily for breaking the stigma around mental health differences and focusing on preventative health. And as you can see on this slide, the well focuses on the eight elements of holistic health and wellness. And as you can see this wonderful um, visual, it's emotional, physical, nutritional, social, intellectual, environmental, spiritual and financial overall health and wellness. And as we all know, the path to wellness is not a one size fits all. And the journey is unique and different for each student at SBCC. And we absolutely honor that at the well. We've always made it a priority for students to feel safe, supported, heard, and respected at our center. And we really want students to become empowered over their health and gain sustainable tools and skill sets to help them on their overall health and wellness journey, not only at Santa Barbara City College, but when they graduate or transfer to their next school or they get to go on to their lives and lead very overall hopefully healthy productive lives next slide please okay next slide please so in order to meet the needs of students with the pandemic and with us all of us working remotely we've had to significantly change the delivery of our service and it's just worked really wonderfully. I had a lot of skepticism, but it's worked wonderfully. So we are currently off this week because we're in intercession and we're not seeing students this week. But the last um, eight weeks or so, we, sweat, we switched from having students come into our office and regularly back to back to doing phone sessions and some Zoom sessions, mostly phone sessions. And our students really appreciated it. They were so grateful that we were still there to them. So we not only were able to provide individual counseling, but also family counseling, couples counseling, and lots and lots of referrals, both locally, countywide, and a lot of our students have moved back home. So we were also helping them find resources in Marin, San Diego, even out of state. Next slide, please. So the main things that we're seeing, we always see a lot of stress and anxiety, as Jeff was pointing out earlier, Mental health has been increasing, the acuity of the mental health cases has been significantly increasing over the last 20 years or so. I can say I've been there a long time. Um, so stress and anxiety is always our top presenting issue. However, it's been even heightened during this time as it is for all of us. There's so much uncertainty. What creates anxiety? Uncertainty. Do we have a lot of that right now? You betcha. So a lot of our students have been having a lot of anxiety due to the social distancing, a lot of them feeling isolated. Some, however, are feeling more supportive because they've gone home. So those with roommate issues are very happy to be with their family, but it, for the most part, it's a really hard time. Financially, it's really tough. I would say three quarters of my student caseload lost their jobs and they were wondering how they're gonna support themselves. 
Then you have the issue of those who are graduating and the loss and the grief about not having graduation and not being able to celebrate this. Weddings canceled, birthdays, everything. So much disappointment and grief going on with that. And grief comes in all shapes and sizes. And then you have all the students who are getting ready to transfer to the Cal States, the UCs, Ab State, who are saying, are my classes gonna be online? Where am I gonna go? What am I gonna do? Where am I gonna live? So much uncertainty. So anxiety has been extremely heightened right now. Academic struggles. I have a lot of students who have never in their life taken an online class and here they are trying to navigate the world of online like we all are, right? But doing it academically is very different. So I found myself doing a lot of life coaching around how to deal with the procrastination, how to deal with getting organized. Depression and suicidal ideation has been on the rise, as we all know, unfortunately, it's the second leading cause of death among college students nationally. However, freezing because I see that my internet is unstable. Hopefully I'm not. Um, I, I know that a lot of us have been having sleep disturbances and insomnia. Um, a lot of that is screen time related, I believe, and also just anxiety related. Relationship struggles, whether it, I'm alone and how do I connect with others or the complete opposite. I'm home with these people 24 seven. We're butting heads. How do I deal with this? So it's on both continuum. And domestic violence has unfortunately become a national uprise right now. Um, it's really sad. I personally really worry about the K through 12 kids whose school is their safe place. That's where they go for safety. Home is not safe and they're home now. So unfortunately, domestic violence is on the rise. We haven't seen that so much in our caseloads, but it's going on in our environments that affects everybody. Next slide, please. So I just want to go over some self-care tips that I've been going over with my students and my caseload, myself, my family, my friends, my colleagues, my loved ones. I think this is important for all of us. Um, whether we are physically active or not, this is a really important time to get to become physically active. It is, as we all know, not to go into the science of it too much, but when we exercise, we release cortisol. That is the stress hormone. And it releases a lot of that stress and anxiety, which will help us sleep better, help us feel better, help us be able to cope with those relationships and be able to communicate much more fluidly. It also releases the feel-good hormones, endorphins, otherwise known as a runner's high. I cannot emphasize enough how much importance it is to get out and work, to walk, jog, get on your bike, do yoga, whatever it might be. I don't know how I would survive without it. Also, there's this misperception that you have to stay inside 24 seven, not true. It's really important to get outside in nature, get some fresh air, connect with the flowers, connect with the trees. I don't know if you guys have all noticed, but I'm seeing more things bloom outside than I've ever seen in my life. Maybe it's the mindfulness that I'm experiencing, or maybe it's that some of us, some of the environmentalists say that our earth is healing right now with the lack of, with less carbon emissions. Getting sleep. If we are depriving ourselves purposely of sleep, please don't do that. Sleep is so essential. I could give another five hour talk on that. I like what Suzanne Grimacy Kirk said in her email. Thank you, Suzanne, if you're watching or Gina, I think you're on there about social distancing does not have to be emotional distancing. Just because we're socially distanced doesn't mean we can't connect with our loved ones. Pick up the phone and call them. Get on the phone, Skype, Zoom, write a letter, Old fashioned letter. I'm connecting with people I haven't talked to in years. It's all of a sudden it's bringing people together. So you bring, come together. Don't feel like you have to stay emotionally distant just because we're not seeing each other. Hugs, I do miss hugs. I, not, I got, got them for my family, but it's very hard to see a friend six feet apart and not be able to give them a hug. So no, we cannot do that, but that doesn't mean we, we aren't staying emotionally close. Something that a lot of my students, my family, my own son, myself have found very, very therapeutic is creative outlets, art, poetry, photography, a, a great meal, coming up with some fun recipes. What creating does is it makes us feel alive. It makes us get in touch with our vitality. 
So finding some kind of creative endeavors is very, very good for our whole wellness, spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally, socially even. Watching movies, funny movies. My son was just watching a YouTube video and cracking up and he was laughing so hard, that really good belly laugh. That is such good therapy. There's also a really fun game I told my staff about this morning. It's on the phone, it's called Psych, P-S-Y-C-H-E. And it's kind of like Balder Lap Dash or um, charades a little bit. You can play it on Zoom with friends, it's hysterical. I recommend playing games, sit down on the floor, play some cards, play an old game, do something fun, laugh. Because right now life is so serious and there's a lot of scary things going on. We need to stay light. Um, really important, this could also be another 10 hour lecture, to learn to be self-compassionate and patient with yourself. We are all discombobulated right now. It's the best word I can come. We're forgetting things. We, our schedules are off. We are completely living in a new way of being. It's really important that we're gentle and compassionate with ourselves right now. I forgot something the, the other day. Instead of getting mad at myself and putting myself down, I said, hey, you're human. It's okay. You're going to make mistakes. I've been more accident prone, spilling things. It's all right. You're out, you're out of your normal routine. We need to be loving and compassionate and gentle with ourselves. We don't want to say anything to ourselves that we don't want to say. We don't want to say to our best friend who we don't want to hate us, right? Why is it okay to be hateful for ourselves? To ourselves, it's not. So now's the time to be really, really, really kind to ourselves. And on that note, practicing gratitude. There is so much to be grateful for. I personally am sitting right here. I'm sitting on the couch. My dog is next to me. He's warm. I'm petting him. I'm grateful for his warm body next to me. I'm grateful that everybody I love is healthy and well right now. Thank goodness. I'm grateful that I have this amazing job that I give my heart and soul to. I couldn't ask for a more wonderful job and people to work with. Hey, Laura out there. I know you're watching. Love you, Laura. Becky, I have the best team in the world. I'm so grateful for you guys. And you know what? If you can't think of something to be grateful, be grateful that you can see us right now. You, you can see us. Think about people who don't have vision. Think about people who can't hear, hear music. You can hear, you can see, you can smell, right? Be grateful for your senses. There's always something to be grateful for. I am so unused to speaking without having people interact and ask questions. So um, I guess we'll get to those at the end. Next slide, slide please. So just real quick, because I don't want to take up too much time. I want to leave some time for questions. I did a kind of a little survey on our electronic medical records to see how many students we saw uh, prior to the COVID closure of everything and coming home and working from home and, and after. And it's about half. So on average, about 110 students a, a week received personal counseling from us. We have 10 therapists, by the way. I didn't mention that earlier. So I just want to quickly mention that there's 10 of us. Um, two full-time licensed therapists, Lacey Peters and myself, and um, a half-time adjunct faculty, Betsy Phillips, who's bilingual and a licensed clinical social worker. And then we have several interns who are getting their hours towards their license and also some um, PhD students from UCSC. All wonderful, wonderful, all at least master's level clinicians. And um, anyway, so we would see about 110 a week prior to the COVID. And then after that, it's about, sorry, about 50, can't control these things. And um, so it's still not bad. Most of us were con working with our clients that we'd already started with. So it was a caseload. The change that we saw was not a lot of new students were coming in when it came to phone sessions and Zoom sessions. So the difference we saw was, I think half of them were the new students that were not necessarily seeking out our um, services. It's one of the challenges when Jeff asked the questions later, it's one of our challenges. How do we bring in new students at this time and let them know we're here? The returning students know we're here. And just so everybody knows, we are going to have uh, telehealth available all summer, all 12 weeks. We will have therapists available to counsel students and it can either be telephone or Zoom. Next slide, please. So how does counseling help? How is it helping at this time? This is how it always helps, but particularly at this time. It allows people to feel heard and connected to a caring person. There's something about being heard that is very healing. And the difference between talking to a friend or family member and talking to a counselor is they're there just for you. 
we're going to have a conversation, but it's really about you. It's not about the counselor talking about their life. It's about them listening to you. And it's very hard to find a situation where you can just be heard. It allows students to express what's going on inside of themselves. Internalizing our feelings is really, really not healthy and it can actually affect the immune system. Research shows that expressing ourselves, whether it be through talking, creating, journaling, it's some kind of uh, way to express ourselves really can support the immune system, which is so important at this time. It's helping, as I mentioned earlier, learning communication skills with family and roommates who students are with 24-7. And if they're alone, then it also helps them have someone to talk about so they don't feel so alone. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of our students are getting tips for motivation, time management, life management, overcoming procrastination. It's really, a lot of them, even though they were super ambitious when they were on campus, are having a hard time motivating in the online format. So we've been kind of coaching them through that process. Teaching students how to be self-compassionate, how to be friends to themselves, how to talk more gently and avoid words like should, can't, right? Learning self-care and mindfulness tools. I did a, probably relaxation exercise and mindfulness exercises with every single one of my students on my phone sessions. So counseling can be very, very healing and having that support can certainly help our immune system during this time where we're all looking out for our health. Okay, next slide, please. On our website, if you go to the Student Health and Wellness website, um, you will find this wonderful on-site and off-site support services and resource guide that we put together. So please feel free to peruse that on the website. It has extensive information and re referrals and resources that you may find helpful, faculty, staff, and students. Thanks. Next slide, please. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about um, the, how we, when we heard the news um, about classes going online and that we were going to be working as a department remotely, we thought, how can we innovatively transition our in-person wellness center into a digital health and wellness hub that's able to operate remotely? And we were just putting our minds together and we needed to do it quickly. So we thought, okay, very quickly, we realized that the Wells website that we already had up and running could become the main platform for communicating a range of mental health and physical health resources and support services, not only to our wonderful Santa Barbara City College student community, but also our wonderful employee community. And we jumped to it and we started adding a lot of different resources and support services onto the main website. And if you all are interested, please come check us out. Uh, we're at www.thewellsbcc.com. Next slide, please. And we were so grateful that in response to COVID-19, we were able to transition some of our most highly attended support groups to Zoom. Um, I was running the positive psychology group. Um, and interesting enough, we saw that more students were attending our support groups during this really difficult time. So I think it really shows that students are craving community. They wanna to come together you know, to feel less isolated, to feel empowered, to talk about their lived experience. And um, for the positive psychology group, we talked a lot about self-care, mindfulness, um, a lot of talking about negative self-talk and how we can rearrange our thinking and um, really just supported each other in this big transition time, as well as we had the single parent support group. I want to give a shout out to Laura Pina and Vicki Navarro, who are amazing personal counselors who run this dynamic group in collaboration with EOPS um, Spark program, and that's run by Chelsea Lancaster. So again, thank you all so much. Um, it just helped so, so much the single parents at our school during this difficult time. And as well, we offered the Well Club, and that is a student-run club where students come together to talk about different health and wellness initiatives and especially about what they were doing for their own health and well-being during this difficult time. And uh, I talked to a lot of the students in the club and they said it was a vital lifeline during this time. And um, I'm so grateful that, you know, students are being empowered. They're taking their own initiative to come together and to help others, um, which I'm, I'm so grateful. That's what our, you know, campus climate does right now. Next slide, please. 
Then um, we decided to start a staying in self-care kit. And this kit provided students and staff with wellness tools, self-care methods, stress management techniques, and creativity boosters. And we got this out within a couple of days of knowing that we had to be remote. So I think it really helped a lot of students figure out ways to handle the anxiety and depression that they were experiencing. Next slide, please. Then we thought, okay, spring break is coming, you know, in March, but unfortunately, due to the shelter in place and the quarantine and not being able to travel, we wanted, you know, students who would either be going to see their families or friends or do things that were, you know, really uplifting and a stress relief during that break of school, we thought, let's give them an alternative activity guide where they can feel nourished and elevated with the time away from kind of academics to find ways to be creative curious and engaged um, during this this one week um, of being kind of away from the education next slide please and then this is the one I'm very excited about we decided to launch um, the Wells digital health and wellness series and this series provides students with a variety of educational and tutorial health and wellness videos for students to learn and develop tangible wellness skills and gain insight into a variety of holistic health practices. And we've already launched uh, one called Keep Well by Eating Well, which is kind of oriented around nutrition and health, um, kind of healthy eating and learning about the medicinal qualities of food. And we also launched one called Lyrical Healing and Creative Expression, and where students were able to learn how to write music and um, or lyrics, um, spoken word, poetry, that can help them relieve their stress, relieve their anxiety, and express their emotions instead of keeping it in, like Allison was saying. It's better for us to, to express ourselves um, through our pain, through our you know, depressed feelings, and really use it for healing. So if you'd like to check out um, the series, it's gonna be an ongoing series. Um, we are looking forward, our next one is gonna be reconnecting with nature and creating remedies for relaxation. We're gonna have one on mindfulness and stress management in a time of isolation. We're gonna be doing, um, I'm very looking forward to this, with the pantry um, and CESJ and Emoja. Um, we're so grateful for their weekly drive-through food distribution days on typically on Wednesdays. And uh, we are gonna be partnering with them to do some new videos around the specific ingredients that students are receiving from the food bank, from this food distribution day, um, how they can make creative, healthy, quick, and obviously now affordable dishes um, from where they're living. So we're looking forward to launching that as well. Next slide, please. Great, so this is, um, we're sorry that we can't play you the video from the Zoom, but if you're interested, you can again go to the website um, or um, uh, Rachel, who is helping us from the foundation, who's lovely, has put it in the chat. So if you want to check it out after the presentation, this is a clip of one of our fabulous three recipe videos. It's a kind of quick and easy, healthy pesto. And this is uh, led by health educator Terry Duffy, who has been so remarkable um, ever since we launched the well. She has come in every month practically to do either a healthy cooking or um, essential oils for healing class, um, very much about holistic healing. And um, this was on um, how students can learn different foods that can boost your immune system when we really need to think about that at a time like this. Next slide, please. And uh, this has been one of our most cherished partnerships. Um, we have a great relationship with the nonprofit called um, Student Health 101, and they have created, it's called Campus Well, and it's an online health and wellness magazine for not only SBC students, but also for universities and colleges throughout the nation. And every week I send out a weekly email that focuses on self-care, reducing anxiety, depression, time management, sleep health, um, indoor fitness, which we all have had to embrace, um, healthy relationship building now that we're inside more and just like Allison said, you know, strain on personal relationships, strain on, um, you know, family relationships, strain with roommates, you know, we're all really 
talking about how to communicate more clearly, um, also how um, social distancing coping skills, and how to be successful navigating and completing online classes. And I think that has big, been one of the biggest struggles students have faced, classes that you know, typically wouldn't be on an online format. They're having to be so resilient and flexible. And um, I really do have so much respect for not only how the, the students handled this time but also the professors and staff and how innovative and creative they've been to making sure students get the best education through this difficult time so if you would like to check out the online wellness magazine uh, the website's right there sbcc.campuswell.com next slide please and then um, lastly, this has been such a beautiful partnership um, over the last two weeks, and we're looking forward to continue this. Um, the Student Health and Wellness Services have been providing hygiene and menstrual care kits at um, the weekly drive through food distribution days. So we've been partnering again with CESJ and Food Pantry and Emoja. We love those programs so much. And um, we're grateful to be able to provide these you know, kits and products that either students aren't able to access right now due to limited supply um, or also the financial burden during this serious COVID time. So we wanted to offer that as a way to keep the stress down and provide them a good hygiene um, kits. Next slide, please. And that is it. Um, Allison and I are so grateful to have talked to you all today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email Allison or I, and uh, please check out our Student Health and Wellness Services email um, and website, and then as well as the WELL website. All right. Well, thank you so much to both of you. I, I'd offer you a, a big round of applause, but in this new Zoom world, we're not sure quite how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just say thank you. Um, I, I want to particularly thank you and acknowledge that, you know, I didn't say this at the, at the outset or in, in the introduction, but the reason the foundation is doing this is because we know that uh, a lot of people in our community don't really get the full scope of what happens at Santa Barbara City College. And of course, it's a renowned first in the country, once again this year, uh, teaching institution, but the, the other infrastructure and the resources that are here uh, often don't get uh, get celebrated in the way that we think they should. Now, of course, on top of that, we've got the issue of stigma that surrounds mental health services and seeking those services. So uh, I just doubly want to thank uh, Becky and, and Allison for, for your time and sharing with us today. I, I have a few questions, and I will say that, uh, again, you can use the uh, chat to, to send questions over, and, and I'll pose some of them uh, to our presenters. But I, I want to start out, but you know, we woke up this morning, some of my colleagues and I, and uh, Ed Source, a an insider a publication that many of us know uh, had a, an article uh, right near the top, as just this morning, uh, about a, some surveys that have been done showing just a remarkable increase in students' need for mental health support. Uh, in fact, it, it said that over 50% by a couple of different measures of students were reporting that they needed and were seeking mental health support services. Um, now, you both mentioned two different dynamics that you saw, and I'm, I'm hoping you can comment a little bit about this. Becky, you mentioned that more people were seeking the community uh, support group uh, structures that you offer. And I know, Allison, you mentioned that uh, you were seeing fewer one-on-one -on -one clients, and partly that's a logistical problem. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamics of how the, I mean, we've never been here before in a, in a global pandemic. So what, what are you seeing as far as trends in either direction uh, as we navigate this just two months in? Well, I think what I mentioned earlier, that the continuing students that worked with all 10 of us on the 10 therapists on campus were definitely wanting to continue their work with us. They definitely wanted the connection. The difference that we saw is that we didn't see a lot of new students coming in, whereas if we were on campus, our very busiest time would have been right around this end of the semester. We would have had all these new students flocking in for support. But test anxiety and the stress of finals and do I finish this, this semester? That was a huge difference that we saw. I don't think it's about stigma. I think it's about access, um, facility, sorry, um, the access, lack of access. They want to come in. It's, okay, this is what I want to say. Students, the millennials, do not like to pick up the phone. They just don't. I'm sorry. They have a hard time. My students watch me pick up the phone and make a call to hospice or something to try to engage them and connect them. And they're looking at me like, whoa, you did that so well. They, they're used to texting, they're used to emailing, they're used to technology, they're not so used to picking up the phone. So I think telehealth is probably daunting to 
a lot of millennials, I'm sorry, I'm really struggling with my words at this moment, to this generation because they are just reluctant to pick up a phone. So I think that may be why the new students didn't flock in. We maybe saw 10 new students in the last period, whereas the, all the returning students were staying with us. They pictured our face, they could see us. It wasn't as scary to have us call them. But to pick up the phone and um, for the first time without really knowing who the person is was probably very daunting. So I think that's a trend that we saw and that is gonna be a challenge. How do we bring new students in who don't aren't familiar with our services rather than they can normally just walk in the student health services and wellness or they can walk into the well, which is a wonderful gateway to us. So that's the challenge that I think we're facing that we really need to work with on how do we bring new people in. The returning students will come, no problem. We're not gonna have any problem even if we stay online in the fall. However, I just, um, I'm wondering if anybody has any feedback on how we can market our services to new students and make it less scary, especially those who have trouble on the phone. We're open to those suggestions. Becky, do you have anything you want to add? Thank you, Allison. You're spot on. Um, just to piggyback of, uh, off of Allison, too, I think the biggest challenge for the well has been how do we recreate that sense of belonging and interaction remotely. So just like what Allison was saying, the well was such a great gateway for students to come in. They could de-stress. They could study. Um, they could engage with their fellow peers around health and wellness. They could have some healthy snacks. And then it was such a nice way for them to say, okay, you know, I feel pretty comfortable in this space. Now let me think about going to counseling one-on-one -on -one or vice versa. Students would start with one of our amazing personal counselors and then hear about the additional resources and support groups at the well and kind of then come join us at that point. Um, so I think for, for me, you know, the well is such a sacred and safe space. So I think being able to, um, through, you know, planning in summer and depending what happens in fall, you know, having a really diverse and dynamic group of support groups and workshops, if, you know, if it ends up being fully digital through Zoom, at least we will be prepared and to really address topics that are coming up for students. Um, for example, um, one of our wonderful counselors, uh, Hanato Marquez, he's going to be doing a great support group about transitioning. It's called STEP, you know, the first step, a journey to your SB SBCC um, education. And so I know there's going to be new students coming in or transferring and, you know, thinking, wow, like, how does this look um, if we are remote or partially remote? So um, I think for the well, our goal is to really be innovative, really be creative and listen to the students. That's what I've always made a priority is what are their needs? What are their interests? And what groups can we create um, going into fall that their need and um, the stress and anxiety that they're they're feeling right now. Great, thank you so much. Uh, you you know you both mentioned partnerships as a big part of how you do your work and, and the community around each of you and, and around the college itself. I, I was speaking with some of our friends at Pacific Pride Foundation this morning uh, about some of the the links there. I, I know on this call we have uh, Gina Carvalho from Glendon Association. We have some folks from CADA. Can you both speak a little bit to to how those partnerships work? Is it is it cross referral? Is it is it joint programming? Uh, I mean, as a community college, we're we're sort of right in the center of, of a little bit of everything. And I, I just wonder if you can describe how you how you make those partnerships work and, and what you gain from that. Yeah, I can I can start with just saying that over the years I've created what's called a mental health advisory board that Gina Carvalho is on, and we have people from hospice, cottage hospital, neighborhood clinics. Uh, Santa Barbara Behavioral Wellness, a bunch of different organizations. We need to add Pacific Pride, that's a good one. But we have a bunch of people come at least once a semester. We, we had one last semester. I think we'll probably have to do it on Zoom maybe coming up here possibly, but we meet once a semester, we collaborate, we talk about what we're all doing. We talk about how we can work better together. So there's faces. We have faces to the people, the major liaisons from those organizations. So when we make referrals, it's very, very smooth. We also have extensive referral lists and we keep up with the information from those referrals for low cost community referrals for students like Community Counseling Center, New Beginnings, Hosford, Family Service Agency. And we stay in touch with those agencies to find out what their latest sliding scales are, how long the waiting lists are, 
We also have extensive referral lists of private practitioners in the community where if a student, let's say, wants to work on an eating disorder, we have a whole list of therapists who I have personally interviewed who are on our list that we can refer students to. So we, it's a kind of a combination of staying in touch with key players in those community referral resources as well as the intricacies of all of the referral sources that are out there. We also have some MOUs with Cottage Hospital and um, in terms of if a student gets into the hospital, they'll communicate with our other full-time therapist, Lacey Peters, and we'll be able to reach out to those students. Um, Laura Ferris has worked very hard to have a really good relationship with the Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics and Planned Parenthood. So we've just individually within our department worked very hard to maintain really good relationships with heads of different centers and to have meetings. Lacey goes out to the county, to the Santa Barbara Behavioral Wellness to their meetings. She goes out to UCSB to their alcohol and drug counseling meetings or alcohol and drug, I'm sorry, community meetings. So we do our best to stay as connected with all the resources in the communities we can so we can have a rich referral resource um, plethora for our students. Becky, is there anything you'd like to add? Thanks, Allison. You know, just one, one extra thing I would say for the well, um, it's been such a privilege to be on a committee. Um, the, the well specifically was um, invited to join. It's called the Youth Well Committee, and um, it is run. Um, just these two women are so dynamic, um, Anne-Marie Cameron and Rachel Steidel um, from the Mental Wellness Center. Um, they have been just incredible to collaborate, and we meet once a month, and it is a group of over 30 different nonprofit agencies and school districts um, within Santa Barbara County and I just have to say what I appreciate and I'm proud to live in Santa Barbara because I think really people in the education and the nonprofit fields that they want to they want to collaborate you know people want to share services and not necessarily have to recreate new ones but how can we you know share and really come together in, as a united front um, for the benefit of our students. And so that has been a wonderful committee to be part of. And um, I, I believe in, you know, reaching the phone or going and visiting um, different health educators and organizations and meeting them face to face to say, you know, what can we do for you as well as how can we collaborate and when students are kind of crossing over from different um, nonprofit organizations and receiving services there and being students at SVCC, I think it opens up a beautiful opportunity for, um, you know, not only having students gain the best support services they deserve and need. Um, so I I've been so grateful for the welcome. You know, I've only been uh, overseeing the well for about um, a year and, and a three, four months. And so I feel like people have really wanted to partner with the what the program is doing. And um, I'm always someone who believes um, we learn every day from each other and we can flex and grow how we need to at the Wellness Center. And um, just like Allison was saying, you know, our director, Laura Ferris, has been just so supportive and her leadership has been incredible. Lacey Peters is amazing and runs our anchor program, which is our alcohol and drug support program program services and um, her and Betsy Phillips, who's one of our uh, licensed uh, social workers, um, also do um, at the well. It's a three days a week and it's called the Well Drop-In Connection um, Hours and that is where they refer students to different resources for mental health, for housing, for food, um, and they are going to be doing it remote um, via Zoom if we end up uh, being remote in fall. So again, we love this team. We're so proud to be part of it and um, we are always wanting to partner. So if anyone out there listening um, wants to be involved, please contact us. Excellent. So the whole is greater than some of its parts. That's that's good to hear. Yeah. I actually have a question for coming from a, a, one of our attendees, and uh, you mentioned it earlier, and, and this is actually somewhat related to this, this notion of referral and partnership. So in the calendar year that you're attached to with the college, how do you fill those gaps when you might not be open or available? Um, the immediate question was, can you say specifically when you will be open and closed through the summer? I think I heard the 12 weeks of summer session you are who are both open and active, um, but you can, can you clarify that and then also just talk about how that, that interacts with those partnerships? Yes, so we are open when students are on campus. 
so we are currently, our services are currently closed this week because it's intercession. We will be open the entire 12 weeks of summer session with counseling available. We then will be closed again between summer session two and fall. I don't know the exact dates in my head, but we can look them up on the calendar. During that time, we are really careful with the students that we see on our caseloads to make sure that they have crisis referrals, that they're not coming back and are going to continue with us. We do work very hard for any students who want long-term therapy to make sure that we get them connected to um, long-term services out in the community. But we have accessible both crisis and long-term community referrals on our website that we refer people to and that we're going to refer you to right now. That resource guide that I showed you earlier in the, um, on the uh, PowerPoint, you can look at that and basically all the resources that they need are on there. And both Lacey and I in our email, if students email us, have all the crisis emergency referrals on there as well. So most services out in the community are open year round. We are different because we are on an academic calendar, calendar and we are only accessible when students are on campus in classes. Does that answer your question? I hope. Yes, <laughs> yes indeed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so another another question uh, Sally Sanger actually just posed to us, and that is, you know, for faculty, and I've had a few conversations with faculty, some of whom are very well aware of, of the offerings uh, of both of these programs, but others that, uh, that it's relatively mysterious or even new to. Um, and the question is, what can faculty do to help support, uh, in this case, the well in particular, or, or just programming around mental health in general, as, as far as whether it's getting the word out or making referrals, or what, what, what can faculty do to, to support you and your work? Do you want me to answer that? Good, good you I'll, I'll start. You, uh, you can jump in. So, a um, couple things. I'm just going to start with the most concerning things. It takes a village. So, faculty and staff, if everybody could keep their eyes open, right now it's going to be partially eyes, but mostly looking at emails or things that are coming in. When we're on campus, if, you, if people notice things that they're concerned about, if you get an email from a student you're concerned about, let us know. Um, go through the report of concern portal on, the, on your um, pipeline. Even if it seems something like something small, let our behavioral intervention team know. We meet weekly and we look at all the reports that come in and we intervene. So if you're concerned about that student who used to sit in the beginning of the class, in the front of the classroom, they're sitting in the back and they've been acting differently, let us know. During this remote time, if you get an email, we had an, a faculty member who um, got in touch with me the other day because one of her students has been using her as a sounding board on his feelings of isolation and his academic struggles. And she really needs to refer to us. So I worked with her on how to set boundaries with him and make sure she gets to a mental health professional rather than her trying to take it on. So setting boundaries is really important. Letting students know who are really looking to you as trying to make, make them um, make you their counselor, make sure you make some referrals to us. Let them know there's very approachable people on campus who they can talk to. And um, definitely let them know about our services. I wish every single instructor and every staff, staff member, member would let students know about the well and our services because everybody can benefit. So I would just say getting the word out, not letting even little things that you're concerned about get bigger nip them in the bud and let the students know, hey, I'm concerned about you. I hear that you seem really sad. You're grieving. You just had a loss. Are you aware that there are people you can talk to on campus? So not being scared to let people know. Students are not going to get upset if you make a referral to us. They're going to feel cared about. So that would be my two cents on that. Becky, is there anything that you could add? Thanks, Allison. Uh, everything you said was spot on. Um, the only other thing I'd add is um, I'm encouraging a wonderful faculty and um, staff who are running uh, classes. Please know that we offer, um, now we're going to, if we, again, if we're remote um, or partially remote, um, I recently did a presentation uh, to Jody uh, Millward's class, the CAP program, and um, I zoomed in and walked the whole class through the different services and resources we offer through student health and wellness in addition to the well. So if any faculty out there would like that, professors, please know I am happy to do that. That's part of my job. Um, we want students to feel comfortable knowing how to access the resources, you know, just so they down the road if they think they need it or currently um, it's something that they desire. Um, I'm happy to do Zoom kind of presentations. Um, we use 
used to have student, our wonderful student workers and myself um, and Lacey Peters. And I know Allison has done this, you know, we do presentations and we, we are grateful to spread the word that way. So um, coming into fall, if that is something faculty would like, please email me and I'd be happy to set something up. Thank you so much. Um, and you do you do serve all students, correct? There's no uh, non-credit, credit, credit part-time, full-time. Everyone's a the old door is open for all students. All students that are enrolled and have paid the student health fee, yes. Okay. Um, the well, they can go in there whether they paid the health fee or not. But for counseling, they need to uh, pay the twenty-two dollar health fee. Health fee. Right. Right. Which is a pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah. across the community. On that note, I just, for those faculty and staff that are watching, whether you're part time or what have you, I just want you to know that Save a Valuable Employee is really wonderful. I personally know people who have used it and it's really helped them. If you're struggling right now, um, another great thing we can do for our students is take care of our own mental health because if we're not doing well, we're not going to be performing as well. So know that that's there for you and there's help for you as well. Right. Somebody had asked about a hotline for students, and there is a 24-hour crisis hotline through the Santa Barbara Behavior Behavioral Wellness. I'm happy to, if you have a pen, I can write it down. I'm not so good at using the chat, but it's um, a 24-hour line that they can call an access line through Santa Barbara Behavioral Wellness. Um, it's 1-888-868-1649, and that will... Somebody, somebody will be there for you to help you, to help connect you to services. We are also working on, as we speak, an after hours crisis line for students that uh, Laura Ferris has been working on called protocol, but it's not quite in place yet. Thank you for typing that. So that there will be an after hours um, emergency line for students. It's just, we're working on it. Laura's working really hard on that. Well, I, I really want to thank you both uh, on behalf of the foundation for doing this. Uh, again, your your uh, work is is so much a part of the infrastructure of the college, and it's a piece that a lot of folks don't get to see. Uh, I'll, I'll just close. I want I want you each to have an opportunity to have the last word here. That's the whole point. Uh, but the, the stats that jumped out to me in this morning's uh, article that I referenced was that there were 22 percent of students in this one survey that had reported having um, mental health needs and having access services before the uh, stay-at-home order, uh, an additional 32% that said that they had needs arising since. So that's where they got their majority, 54% in all. So clearly we're in a moment where there's, there's a major need and, and what you both do and all of your colleagues is very much appreciated. So, so thank you both so much on behalf of the entire community. Uh, but uh, Becky, do you have a, a final few thoughts or words or anything you'd like to share before we sign off? Sure, um, I, I keep on reminding myself of the saying you hear, it's okay to not be okay. And I think that a lot of our students, you know, knowing that, you know, whether you're staff, faculty, you know, whatever role you play on campus, you know, always being open to students about, you know, we are here for you. We, you know, want to guide you on this journey. You're always in the driver's seat, but I always like to say we're co-pilots. We're like, maybe make a left here or keep on going straight and watch that dip, you know? So again, we, we are so in awe of our students over this very, very painful eight, uh, eight weeks now, um, over eight weeks. And um, I just wanna, you know, again, just say that we are here for our students. We are gonna be, continue to be innovative and that we wanna listen and hear what students are wanting moving forward and that we're gonna address as best as we can um, the needs. And um, I'm grateful to, to present with Allison. I love our team and uh, thank you for having us today. It's been an honor. Thanks. Thank you everybody for being here and uh, email us if you have any issues. Our emails are on our website. We're happy to answer any questions for you. Stay safe and well everybody and take really good care of yourself. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. So again, Allison, Boss, and, and Becky Bean uh, with our mental health team here at the, uh, the Santa Barbara City College. Um, thank you both. We may well have you back. There's much to talk about here. It's our time, but it, there clearly could be another hour or more of this. So we may well, uh, continue this. Uh, and again, this is a series that we've, we've just begun in the last few weeks. This is our third. Uh, next week, next Thursday at 4 p.m., we're going to have a look at uh, student supports through an equity lens. We're going to have Roxanne Byrne of the, uh, the uh, interim director of our equity uh, programs. And we also will have Paloma Arnold, who's the director of EOPS at SBCC, 
uh, sharing with us a bit about how they do their work, uh, not only in a, in a typical day, but in this new pandemic remote world. So um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all to the community members who joined us today. And uh, we will hopefully see you back next week. Uh, this, will be this is being recorded and will be posted uh, in short order up on our website as well. So thank you all. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.